Why don't we why don't we begin the YouTube? Oh, there's Andrew. <laughs> Very good. Andrew just appeared. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Hi, Andrew. Hello, Andrew. Now we're complete. Okay, um, we should we should begin. Um, welcome all to this session on uh, Leibniz and Newton um, of the Princeton Bucharest uh, seminar in early modern philosophy. <laughs> And the speakers, of course, today are going to be Vincenzo De Vizi and Andrew Janiak. Um, shall we combine the discussion period for the both of them, Andrew and um, Vincenzo? Or do you want to do a separate um, um, question period after Vincenzo's and then after yours? What do you yes, think? I think it may work better. I think that Andrew will comment on, on, on my paper. And after Andrew's comments, I think we may open up the discussion to everybody. Great. Then that's the way we'll do it. Okay, Vincenzo, um, why don't you begin? Do you need, are, are you going to share your screen? Yes, 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 I'm doing that. Uh, uh, so, but, but first, thank you, Diane, thank you, Dana, thank you, Claudia, for, for, for organizing this, and, and most of all, thanks to Andrew for having accepted to, to uh, I mean, to discuss with us uh, 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 this paper. I'm, I, I'm, I'm very happy to have you all here. So, my, my, uh, uh, my idea today was to share with you some kind of, uh, uh, let's say, a sort of discovery that I think I made in, in Leibniz studies for Leibniz theory of, of, of space. Uh, it all began when I, when I was working on Leibniz, uh, uh, on Leibniz geometrical papers and in order to solve some dating problems, I just listed all the occurrences of Leibniz works, published works in, in, in which he mentioned space. Some, somehow, or, or place, situation, position, I mean, special terms. I, I made this list in, in chronological order, and, and when I look at it, I, I, I saw a, a kind of picture that I was not expecting now, and that I think is not known to most of Leibniz uh, uh, studies as well. So I, 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 I will talk to you about this uh, unexpected uh, thing that I that I found. Uh, uh, so it will be a kind of a talk on 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 the chronology and development of Leibniz theory of space. But in the end, I'm I'm keeping also a kind of surprise uh, it, that I think may broaden uh, uh, a lot the interest of the talk, and not just for Leibniz scholars, but for scholars in the early modern philosophy and early modern science uh, more in general. But I'm keeping this for, for the last part of the talk. And I just began playing with uh, uh, um, something on Leibniz theory of space. So, sorry, this is not here, okay. So I'm, I'm, I, uh, uh, I mean, all you know, of course, that Leibniz theory of space uh, uh, was expanded by him in the correspondence with Clark in the last year of his life in, in 1715, uh, uh, 16. In this correspondence, Leibniz famously claimed that space is uh, a system of relations. Here you have uh, one of the famous quotations from the correspondence, I hold space to be something purely relative, just like time. I hold it to be an order of coexistences as time is an order of successions. This theory by Leibniz, that is a space, uh, is a system of relations, uh, 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 clashed in the Leibniz Clark correspondence with Newton's opposite view that space is uh, something, well, perhaps substantial, but in any case, absolute. And uh, from 
the publication of the Leibniz Clark correspondence in, in, in 1717, uh, many, many uh, uh, philosophers and scientists continued to discuss this famous correspondence and, uh, and, and, the, uh, and the opposite thesis that space is, is, a, is relational or rather, or rather absolute. You find uh, plenty of discussions in the 18th century, in the 19th century with Marx, in the 20th century with Reichenbach and many others. And, and uh, the debate is still very, very, very alive uh, <laughs> in philosophy of physics and philosophy of space-time. Uh, uh, <laughs> now, Leibniz's theory of space as a system of relations was new was really new. And, and, and this was new from an absolute point of view in the sense that we do not know sources that Leibniz could have uh, uh, read in order to get to that theory. It was a theory largely unprecedented in the 17th century. So something that he mainly invented from the scratch. But it was also new for, for Newton and Clark since Leibniz had not published anything on this theory of space, and, and so when, uh, when he expounded it in the Leibniz-Clark correspondence, both Newton and Clark were uh, uh, taken off guard by Leibniz's views. Uh, with the, the following publication of Leibniz, uh, 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 of Leibniz manuscripts, many, many manuscripts, we found, I mean, Leibniz scholars found uh, uh, dozens, in fact, hundreds of pages of the unpublished uh, uh, papers by Leibniz in which he developed and, uh, and defended the theory that space is a system of relations. That is, it is not absolute, but, but, but it is a, 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 an order of, of sorts. Now, this very discovery, the fact that Leibniz had uh, uh, expanded a lot on, on, on the theory, however, had the consequence that many scholars began to think that Leibniz's famous theory of space as a system of relations was there since the beginning. That is, that there was no or almost no evolution in Leibniz's views. Now, what I what I what I saw in in, in looking as I, I as I told you at the at the chronological order of Leibniz's uh, uh, references to space with a, with a fresh view, so to say, with a fresh point of view, uh, uh, is, is, is very different though. I mean, this text uh, 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 tell another story. As a matter of fact, uh, till the late 1680s, there are no traces at all of the theory of space as a relation or a system of relation in Leibniz's writings. Now, the late 1680s, as Leibniz uh, scholar uh, uh, know, it, it, it's quite late for Leibniz. That is, many, many uh, of his other theories have been already fully developed. In particular, many important work like the, the Discourse of Metaphysics, the correspondence with Arnaud, but also the logical works in which he dealt with the theory of relations, all of those had been already uh, uh, written by him. So. Uh, there is a long period of Leibniz's life in which he, he developed his famous philosophy, in which, however, he did not support a theory of space as a system of relations. So when, when he did the, the most important metaphysical steps in, in, in his career, he was not claiming that space is a system of relations. And so I think there's this calls, in fact, for a kind of reassessment of Leibniz uh, uh, philosophy in general, but, but for Leibniz theory of space in particular. So I, I, I will just sketch you a, a, a very quick outline of what we can draw from, 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 from these uh, uh, references of Leibniz to space uh, uh, throughout his life. Uh, I think that uh, Leibniz's views on space may be broadly arranged in, in, in three different uh, 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 times. That is, the uh, first uh, uh, bunch of years in which he was very young and he endorsed the idea that, Leibniz, that space is a substance. Then you get something like 
Leibniz's middle years from 72 to the late 80s, in which he uh, uh, disregarded the idea that space is a substance, but did not endorse a relational theory of space. And then you have, since the late 80s or the early 90s, to the end of Leibniz's life, in fact, uh, the advocacy of a theory of relations. Let's just very briefly solve these, these stages. Well, on the first, I will not say much. I mean, uh, uh, we, we have uh, mostly student notes by Leibniz in which he uh, uh, considers space as a substance. It, it is clearly influenced by uh, uh, Italian Neoplatonist philosophers like Patrizzi, Bruno, and Campanella in believing that space is, uh, uh, as you can read in the last line of the quote here, is almost more substantial than body. He claims that space is a substance. He claims that it comes before all bodies, that it, it is the condition of all bodies, and, and, and that uh, an, an empty space, that is to say, a vacuum is possible, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, 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 this is especially expounded in the correspondence from 68-69 that he had with his former professor of philosophy, Jacob Tomasius. And, and the same uh, theory of space as a substance is still underlying Leibniz's first work in natural philosophy, that is to say, the so-called hypothesis physica nova that he wrote when he was very young. However, in uh, 1672, when Leibniz was only 26 years old, he arrived in Paris. In Paris, he, he came in contact with a completely different environment uh, of, of, of philosophers and scientists, with Huygens, with other people working in the Cartesian tradition, and he quickly relinquished this idea that space is a substance. And, and uh, he settled on the idea that space does not exist as an independent uh, uh, being, but rather the only thing that are in the world are the bodies themselves. So you do not need a container for the bodies. There is no vacuum at all. Everything is filled and the extension of the world is just the extension of the bodies without uh, uh, any need of, 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 of postulating another extension that would be a, a substantial space. Now, the fact that uh, 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 in, in, in 1672, Leibniz began to write that space is not real, and he says this many, many times, uh, 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 brought people to believe that at that point, Leibniz had already advocated a relational theory of space. Because of course, when you read Leibniz's later statements, uh, 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 to the effect that space is not real, he adds space is not real because it is a system of relations. It is not a substance, but it is rather uh, uh, an order of situation, an order of coexisting things and, 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 and so on. But of course, this, this influence does not hold because of, uh, there were many, many uh, uh, theories of space in the 17th century, in fact, the most common theories of space in the 17th century were neither substantial nor, nor relational. I mean, Descartes took space to be some kind of abstraction, Hobbes to be uh, 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 some kind of, uh, of uh, product of imagination. Scholastic philosophers thought it to, to be a pure negation or, or, or again, an imaginary extension and so on. Uh, 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 and so did Leibniz. That is, when in, in 72 he abandoned the idea that space is a substance, he did not replace this theory with his later, much later theory and new theory that space is a system of relations at all. Now, this confusion among the interpreters, I will dwell a bit on it because I think it is interesting to, or to better understand Leibniz himself, uh, uh, was grounded on the one hand, clearly on the projection of the leibniz clark correspondence on Leibniz's uh, uh, early views. Since Leibniz, in the leibniz clark correspondence, opposed a substantialist and a, a relationalist theories of space, one thing that when Leibniz abandoned the substantialist one, he had to embrace 
the rationalist one. But, but this, of course, is from the uh, uh, perspective of, of the Leibniz Clark correspondence. But, but even more importantly, Leibniz presented in his later years his theory of space as a system of relations as the part of a broader philosophical and metaphysical picture in which time was also irrational. You have read <laughs> the quotation above that space is the order of coexistence, time is the order of succession. Then he presented it as perfectly integrated with the idea that motion is relational as well. And, and then even that, that, that geometry is only uh, dealing with, uh, with relations themselves. So he, Leibniz himself, presented these theories as constituting a, a kind of harmonic whole. <laughs> and therefore, interpreters have thought that Leibniz had developed all these theories together. But of course, this is not the case of the historical development of Leibniz's ideas. He, he embraced a theory, a, a relational theory of motion and time and geometry much earlier than a, a proper relational theory of space. So, for instance, by about uh, uh, 1676, so very early when Leibniz was 30 year old, he explicitly endorsed the relational theory of motion. He, he says that, and it follows that motion and rest taken as absolute are empty names and what is real in them, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, is found in, in, in the relative changes of bodies. Uh, 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 so people point the finger here and say, you see, uh, uh, there is relational motion in 76, so there is relational space in, in 76. But of course, this doesn't follow because relational motion was a common theory in the 17th century, whereas relational space was not. I mean, Descartes, Huygens, many other people conceived the motion as relational and no one of them dreamed of, of thinking space as a system of relations at all. So this, this, this influence doesn't work, but this influence is so powerful that in fact, it affected in, in a very important way, even the addition of Leibniz papers by, by, by the academy. Here you find a, 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 a piece of the critical edition of, of Leibniz uh, uh, papers on, uh, on philosophy in which you find this uh, 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 fragment from the 77, 1677, uh, uh, titled Space and Motions are in truth relations. Now, the problem with this is that the title of the piece is not Leibniz. The title of the piece is uh, editorial. I mean, it, it is the editor of the critical edition of Leibniz uh, 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 papers that put this title. But this piece is, I mean, they were so convinced that the theory of relational motion and the theory of relational space went hand in hand that even titled with this title, a, a, a piece that simply does not say so. If you read the, the main piece, what, what Leibniz wrote, you find that, well, there are several sentences on, on the fact that when he was younger, he had entertained a theory of absolute space, but then he concludes that in fact, such a space that is absolute space is not a thing. And motion is not something absolute, but consists in relation. Sed revera, spazium illu de res non est, neque mortus est aliquid absolutum, sed consisted in relation. Now, all that Leibniz is saying here is that space is not a thing. And motion is relational, but he is not claiming that space itself is made up of relations. But as I said, the illusion that these theories got together was so strong that the editors gave this title and, and, and many, many interpreters, of course, just reading the title, believed that in 77, Leibniz was already endorsing a, a, a relational theory of space. Something similar happens with Leibniz's theory of time. We have texts from 78, or, eight, or 1680, in which Leibniz 
says explicitly that time is an order. But of course, this was not a, 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 a novel theory. I mean, the idea that time is an order is, is to be found in Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle in the categories says that time is a taxis, is an order. So the fact that Leibniz was endorsing this theory when he was young doesn't mean at all that he also believed that space should be a system of relations. In fact, uh, there is even something, something more. I, 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 mentioned, uh, I mentioned before here uh, 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 that passage of the leibniz clark correspondence in which he defined uh, a space and time as the, the order of co coexistence and the order of succession. Now, in, in this, now this kind of formulation is very common in Leibniz's later uh, uh, text. In this text, Leibniz is not saying that both space and time are relational. What Leibniz is saying is that space, just like time, is relational. That is to say, Leibniz was expecting that his reader would agree that time is an order, that time is a relation. And, and what he is, is claiming is that, look, for me, space is relational as well, just like time, just you have always considered time to be. So the, the novelty of Leibniz's approach was to bring space into this picture rather than saying that uh, uh, time is relational. So for now, Leibniz was endorsing very standard theories about motion and about time. I will skip the part on geometry and, and we'll just sketch something of what we can, uh, we can think of Leibniz space in the, in the middle years, that is to say, after 1672, when he abandoned the idea of space as a substance, but before he arrived to the idea that space is a system of relations. Now, the picture that Leibniz had at that time is, I think, rather standard, not entirely standard, but rather standard. And, uh, and it is that space is uh, something mind dependent, which is produced by some kind of an act of abstraction. You have the world, which is made of corporeal substance, let's say a, a world of bodies, without uh, uh, any vacuum. And, and this world of bodies is the only extension that you have, the only substantial extension that you have. There is no container. But you may abstract from every feature of these bodies, you may abstract from their qualities, from the forces, from the entelechies and substantial forms. You may abstract even from the uh, 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 impenetrability of, of, of these bodies. And what is left is pure extension. This pure extension, Leibniz calls it ex explicitly an extensum purum, is a space. So space is, is just the extension of the material word of the bodily word considered somehow in abstraction from every other uh, 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 feature. Uh, sometimes Leibniz says that this kind of space is an aggregate. This is not strange if you think so, because uh, uh, this space is just, uh, in fact, the sum of all the extension of all the bodies in the world. So it is just the whole extension of the world considered as, as, as an aggregate of all the corporeal substances or all the bodies in the world. One thing which is peculiar of Leibniz is that he claims con, uh, against uh, Descartes and other people who believed that, that space was somehow an arbitrary uh, 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 abstraction, that this is not the case. That is to say, Leibniz insists on the fact that the act through which we get to space is not arbitrary insofar as the extension is a, a, an essential property of bodies. That is, when we consider bodies, bodies are objectively extended. And, and when we get uh, uh, rid of all the other differences and we arrive to the pure extension which we call space, we are 
pinpointing something which is the essence of every possible body. And so this is not uh, uh, gratuitous. So our, our act of abstraction is well-founded in the nature of bodies themselves. Some other times in other texts, Leibniz says, uh, but, but I think that it, it more or less expresses the same thing. He says that uh, uh, space is founded in the divine immensity, where the divine immensity seems to be just the fact that all bodies are extended. So let me say something about this kind of almost a scholastic conception of space that Leibniz entertained in the Middle Years in, in, in comparison with Leibniz's later views. Well, first of all, Leibniz uh, did not believe in the Middle Years that space was a relation or an order of relations. This whole relational vocabulary simply does not appear in the text until the late 1680s. Second, Leibniz, when he was uh, 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 debating with Clark, said that space is an order of possible relations or possible situation. This doesn't happen in the Middle Years. In the Middle Years, space is not modelized, it's not conceived as something possible. Rather, I mean, space is just the extension of the actual world. There is the actual world and, and, and space is that kind of extension considered uh, 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 per se. Third, space is not properly speaking abstract. I mentioned a, 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 a process of abstraction through which space is uh, obtained, but the idea is that you do not abstract something to get space, but rather you abstract from several things. That is, you take the word of bodies and you do not consider some features of it. What is the result of this abstraction process is a concrete being that is space that is stripped of all other properties that you find in bodies. So, so once again, this is not a universal, it's not a, a, a thing, a, a conceptual thing. It is a concrete object of the world. Finally, and, and most importantly, in the eighties, Leibniz calls this space a phenomenon. Now, this uh, uh, this expression had been discussed a lot by interpreters who did not understand well how could Leibniz think that an order of relations could be called a, a phenomenon in the 80s. But the answer is just that in, in the 80s, the space was not conceived by him as an order of relations at all. If you consider the picture of space that I have attempted to uh, uh, present you as a concrete thing, which is obtained by stripping the, the bodily uh, uh, world by all other uh, 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 properties, you, you, you get that space in this sense is an object, is concrete, is actual, it is partly mind-dependent mind because it is built on some kind of abstraction of, 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 of properties, but it is also partly objective because it, 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 uh, it pinpoints an essential property, so it is well-founded. And it is even more an aggregate of the extension of the various bodies. If you're familiar with the many, many meanings of a phenomenon in Leibniz writings, you find many things here that will point to the fact that this kind of space clearly is for him a phenomenon. I mean, a phenomenon is an object, it is concrete, it is actual, it is partially mind-dependent, but it is nonetheless well-founded in, in something which is there in, in nature. It is an aggregate of things. All of these are cl uh, uh, classical characterization of Leibniz of what a phenomenon is. So this more or less was Leibniz's theory of space. In, in the Middle Years. And as you can say, see, it is very, very different from the late theory discussed with Clark. Uh, 
I mean, I, 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 I repeat, it's not a relation. It's not an order of possible relation. It is not abstract. It is not idea, an ideal thing, but rather it is a phenomenon. It is a completely different thing uh, uh, compared with space in the leibniz clock correspondence. So the question now is what, what happened and, and when it happened that Leibniz changed his mind? I mean, how, how he arrived from this very different picture of space to the conception of space that he held in the leibniz clock correspondence. So we move to the final part of the talk, that is to say the relational theory. Well, if you look at all the occurrences of space in Leibniz writings in a chronological way, you find that the first one in which Leibniz says that space is somehow relational is a small marginal note on an essay that he called the Specimen Inventorum, written at the end of the uh, 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 1680s. Here, I mean, in the Specimen Inventorum, Leibniz is, is, is dealing with many topics on, on metaphysics. And then at some point, he has a marginal note in which he says, space and time are not things, but real relations. There is no absolute place or movement since there are no principles for determining the subject of movement. So here, space and time are not things, but real relations. <laughs> this is the first time that Leibniz calls space and time relations. Of course, this is not a very good characterization. Uh, 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 Leibniz uh, later theory is that space and time are systems of relations, not relations in, in such a general way. So it is a, a bit an awkward, uh, uh, an awkward formulation perhaps. But in the following months, we have some other papers in which he adjusts the <laughs> this definition, and most of all, we have independent papers dealing with space as a relation. That is not a marginal note, but sketches and, and texts on, on, on this point. Uh, uh, for what we can say now with what is published at, at, <laughs> at the moment, Leibniz' uh, uh, conception of a relational space evolved in the following years. And apparently the first time in which he called space, not just a relation, but an order is a, a, a piece uh, commenting Fardella in 1692, that is uh, in the early nineties. And, and here he says, space is not a, a body nor a substance, but the order of possibility of coexisting things, just as time is the order of possible changes. Uh, you may notice that uh, in this text for 92, space is already modelized. That is, uh, uh, Leibniz is already talking about uh, an order of possibilities rather than an order of, of, of uh, uh, real things. And finally, uh, uh, in all these uh, 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 texts, space is called abstract rather than concrete. And, uh, uh, and in fact, uh, the earliest occurrence of the word uh, uh, ideal that I was able to find was in a letter to Fouché in 1695. It may be earlier, I don't know, because we do not have the complete work of Leibniz from, from, from those years. Uh, 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 and that space is ideal will become a, a, a commonplace in Leibniz texts of, of, of the later years. And in particular, he will oppose the being ideal of space to the being a, a, a phenomenon. That is to say, by saying that space is abstract and ideal, Leibniz is also saying that space is not a phenomenon as he conceived it uh, uh, earlier. Uh, so we, we, can, we can try to uh, uh, focus a bit more on, on, uh, on, uh, on what was happening in the specimen inventorum um, in, in, in the late 80s. And, and attempt to give a, a date for Leibniz's important change of views about space. And uh, well, the Specimen Inventorum, when 
uh, space is said to be relational for the first time has long been dated to around 1686. This is a very complicated text because it, I mean, it's editorial story. It's very complicated because it was published in, in pieces, then, then got, uh, uh, I mean, then grouped again, uh, etc. But But Harry Parkinson published the first version, complete version of the specimen inventorium and he dated it to 86. Some, a couple of decades later, than Parkinson uh, uh, articles, the Academy edition established that the specimen inventorium was in fact written on a paper uh, uh, made in Vienna. And since Leibniz had been in Vienna in fall and winter from 1688, it is impossible that the specimen inventorium is from 86. And in fact, it should be placed to uh, 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 88. Okay, now I come to what I, I, I think is, is the most surprising thing of all this story, and the most important. So now, I, 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 I just uh, 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 talked about a story about Leibniz's own development and the theory of space in, in various decades. So many of you will say, okay, Leibniz's theory of relational space is not from the 70s, it is from the 80s. Maybe it is not from 86, it is from 88. But in the end, who cares? Well, the point is that this exact dating is very important. Not 86, but 88, not the 70s, but 88. Because what Leibniz was doing in 88, when he was in Vienna, he was doing several things. He was writing a lot of papers, but at some point, Every other occupation of Leibniz was wiped out. He stopped doing everything else and he read Newton's Principia. That is, Newton's Principia were written in 87 and he read it in, in Vienna in the, the fall of 1688. We may say something more. That is, uh, we have uh, Leibniz's own annotations on the Principia that he took in Vienna and these annotations on, on the Principia are written on the same sheet of paper than the Speculum Inventorum itself. Apparently, Leibniz had a big sheet of Viennese paper. He cut it into pieces, and in some of these pieces, he took notes about uh, Newton, and in some of other pieces, he wrote the Speculum Inventorum in the same days, in the same weeks. Uh, uh, in fact, even if you look at the at what Leibniz writes in, in, in the marginal note of the Specimen Inventorum, I mean, here you have a, a, a short quote of Newton's uh, famous scolium uh, to the definition where, where, where he mentions uh, absolute space and absolute time. And he talks about uh, loca absoluta, et cetera. Now, Let's reread Leibniz's marginal note. Space and time are not things but relation. There is no absolute place or movement since there are no principles for, for determining the object of movement. You see, he, he's talking about locus absolutus, which is something that appears in Newton's column and something that you never find in Leibniz's writing. He's not opposing substantial space or space as a thing. He's a, 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 a uh, opposing locus absolutus. I mean, who was talking about locus absolutus at the time? Of course it was Newton. Uh, and he was opposing absolute movement as well. Mm. Let, me, let me overdo a, 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 a bit. Uh, I, I may even give you a conjecture. I mean, as, as I said, at some point Leibniz uh, uh, cause of space and order of situations. This is the standard uh, uh, definition of space uh, given by Leibniz in later years. Space is an order of situations. But you see here in Newton's column, in Newton's column, Newton says, all things are placed in time with reference to the order of succession and in space with reference to the order of situation, ordo situs. So it is even possible, I mean, we do not know this for sure, but it is even possible and likely, I would say, that Leibniz took 
the very definition of space as a nodal situation from Newton's scholium in the Principia. Of course, Newton's conception of space was different. He was not saying that space is an order of situation. Newton was saying that in space, there is an order of situations. And Leibniz is saying, forget about space. The order of situation is enough to define what you want to define, that is to say, space. So let, let's catch this. But a bit. In, in, in 1688, Leibniz read Newton's Principia. He realized that Newton used in the Principia a new conception of space, and that many of, uh, and that a great part of Newton's physics and natural philosophy was in fact grounded on this idea of absolute space. He wanted to overthrow it. He wanted to overthrow it, and so in reading it and in preparing many of his anti-Newtonian essays. In, in the early 90s, he understood that he had to develop an alternative conception of space. So at this point, he put, I mean, he began to think and put together his theory of relational motion, his theory of relational time, everything. And he arrived to the new idea, to the novel idea that space is not absolute, but rather is an order of relations, is a system of relations. Of course, this puts even the Leibniz Clark correspondence in a new uh, 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 perspective. I mean, we cannot say, of course, that Leibniz was preparing the Leibniz Clark correspondence uh, since 25 years. But what is true is that Leibniz theory of space was not developed independently of Newton. And at some point, by chance, these two very different theories of space clash in the Leibniz Clark correspondence. Rather, Leibniz read Newton, understood that he had to hit Newton in the theory of space, and he created a new theory of space with the exact aim of bringing Newton down. And so he produced this new theory. And when he arrived in, in the midst of the, of the dispute over priority and so on, he attacked Newton, writing to the Princess of Wales, uh, uh, Mr. Newton has a very extraordinary philosophy about space, et cetera, et cetera. And this uh, 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 let the leibniz clark correspondence begun. Uh, 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 and when the Princess of Wales asked Leibniz, who is Newton? Uh, how, how good is Newton? Leibniz, uh, 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 as you know, replied, he is my rival. I do not need to add anything else. And, 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 and so was for, for Leibniz's theory of space. Okay, thank you. That is. Thank you very much, Vincenzo. That was very exciting. Um, Andrew, um, Andrew Janiak is going to um, deliver a, a commentary on this, and then we'll have discussion. Uh, Andrew? Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Do you need to share your screen? No, I'm just going to um, chat. It, it, it's a short commentary, so I didn't think we needed any slides. Um, Thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to present some thoughts about Vincenzo's paper, which is incredibly interesting. Uh, I thank Claudia and everyone in Bucharest. And we're thinking of you now uh, because we are very aware you're near a war zone and we hope you're all safe. Um, on, on the topic of the paper, uh, I'm in one of those positions you get in sometimes in philosophy where you actually agree with the paper so strongly you can't do that thing you were trained to do, you know, think of an objection, that kind of thing. Um, instead, I want to take this as an opportunity to just mention a little bit about how Vincenzo's paper illustrates a broader point, namely, and this will not surprise you coming from me, we still have not integrated our understanding of Newton's work into our understanding of late 17th and early 18th century philosophy. I think this illustrates it perfectly, and I'm going to give some other examples that I take to illustrate 
that same point. Um, and I think, uh, and I hope people will take this as a broader point, not just about Linus's theory of space, which Vincenzo has so expertly outlined, but also about other issues, not only in Linus scholarship, but even in um, other areas as well. So I actually just wanna make five simple points and then I hope there'll be lots of discussion. So um, number one, I think Vincenzo's paper really beautifully shows that we often tacitly make assumptions that are harmful in our understanding of space, time, and motion. And I know I've been guilty of this. He illustrates very nicely that if someone thinks that time is relational or time is an order, you can't infer that they think that space is relational or that space is an order. Uh, as he shows, Leibniz developed different views about time and space over the years. Uh, I think we often, unfortunately, just assume that if someone denies that space is real or denies that it's a substance, that must mean they think it's relational. And they, they need not think that. I think he illustrates that very nicely, and it's a very important reminder, in my opinion. So that's the first very general point. Um, the second point has to do with Leibniz's confrontation with Newton's Principia in, in 1688. This is something that I think is far more important than a lot of us have recognized. Uh, as you might imagine, I would think that. Um, I think he beautifully shows that Leibniz was confronted with a problem, namely uh, Newton had argued, as you all know, that Descartes was wrong about the true motion of a body which I'll return to in a few minutes, that true motion is not a change in relations, but is actually, sh should be understood as absolute motion, and therefore you have a theory of absolute space. So then you have Leibniz confronting this view and developing for the first time, the idea that you should think of space as relational because you have already thought of motion as relational. We should not assume that you automatically believe that space is relational just because you think motion is relational. That was a, a conceptual move that Leibniz made, as Vincenzo outlines. In relation to that, I would also note that it's very important to watch when Leibniz is using the terminology of an uh, opponent or just another philosopher. So I think Vincenzo very nicely shows how it looks like Leibniz is using the idea of an order of situations from Newton's scolium. And one of my own personal pet peeves is that people do not closely track his uh, use of the terminology of the Cartesians right around this same time. So I think it's very important to do that. And I'm going to try to illustrate why. So my opinion is if you take Vincenzo's view and you think about other things that are happening right at this time, 1686 to 1688, you of course have the beginning of what we later call the vis viva controversy. And I would uh, urge everyone to watch Leibniz's terminology as carefully as Vincenzo has. And this brings in Newton once again. As you probably all know, lots of scholars say the vis viva dispute concerns the question of whether MV or MV squared is conserved. And of course, this is anachronistic terminology. In fact, in March 1686, when Leibniz publishes the Brevis Demonstratio, he very explicitly is using the terminology of the Cartesians. And he is talking about um, molus and corporum. He's talking about bulk or volume and speed. He is not talking about what Newton calls mass and velocity. And that's appropriate when you're arguing against the Cartesians. I'll just note, Vincenzo is suggesting after Leibniz reads the Principia for the very first time in 1688, of course, he's now in a position to think about the mass of a body, which Newton defines in the definitions um, as the quantitas materiae. And he is explaining, as I'm sure you all know, that Descartes' view of the quantitas materiae is incorrect. 
And instead we should think of uh, mass, not moles or bulk. And of course, Newton is interested in velocity and not speed, although that can be put aside for the moment. So I would urge people to distinguish between Leibniz's use of Cartesian terminology in 1686, when he had not encountered the Principia, and then the specimen dynamicum in 1695, after he had confronted the Principia. In the first text, Leibniz is clearly using Descartes' view that we're talking about the product of, in fact, I looked this up to be sure I had it right, uh, the product of um, moles and um, uh, velocitatum, but he does not distinguish speed or velocity. In 1695, Leibniz would be in a position to talk about the mass of a body following Newton if he wished to do so. And so I would suggest Leibniz scholars look very carefully at these two different texts and think of the vis viva controversy in the context of Leibniz's confrontation with Newton's Principia in 1688. We should not assume that the texts are making the very same point about vis viva. Now, uh, one note about that, um, and this is a third point, it is not only uh, scholars who are sometimes, in my opinion, unclear about this point, but even sometimes historical actors themselves. So I just wanted to point out that Clark himself, in my own opinion, muddied the waters about vis viva. I don't know if people are aware of this, but the Lyman's Clark correspondence, um, as Vincenzo says, of course, has received so much attention that we sometimes retroactively reinterpret texts from the late 17th century using the conceptual framework of the Leibniz Clark correspondence. Uh, but in particular, on this point that I'm making now, unfortunately, I think Clark himself muddied the waters. So the, the correspondence is known mostly, as you all know, because of debates about the divine will, space and time, gravity, action at a distance, miracles, and so on. However, at the very end, Clark is uh, trying to ensnare Leibniz into a debate about vis viva. This is something I didn't really realize until I've been teaching it for many years. It's a very odd move for Clark to make, but basically here's how it goes, just to remind you. In his last letter, Leibniz says, um, I'll just quote from the 99th section of the last letter. I do not undertake here to establish my dynamica or my doctrine of forces. This would not be a proper place for it. And then he says, um, I agree that the quantity of motion does not remain the same in a, in a, in a collision where this, the force is conserved. And in this, I approve what Sir Isaac Newton says in his optics, page 341, which the author here, namely Clark, quotes. So Linus is trying to find common ground. He does not want to uh, engage in a debate on vis viva here. And I think that's mostly because that's not a debate with the Newtonians. That was a debate with the Cartesians. But Clark refuses this, this uh, olive branch, so to speak. And even when Clark discusses the paper from the Acta Eruditorum in 1686, before Leibniz had read Newton's Principia, before anyone had read Newton's Principia, um, because it was March 1686, even when discussing that, Clark says that uh, Leibniz is wrong. Leibniz is wrong to speak of what he calls the quantity of matter and velocity squared, because Newton has shown, in fact, that force is proportional to the quantity of matter and velocity. So Clark is taking these Newtonian ideas, which would have been totally unknown to Leibniz in 1686, and reinterpreting the Brevis Demonstratio in their terms and making it sound like Leibniz made some kind of mistake when in fact Leibniz was making an argument against the Cartesians and not against uh, a, a, a text that hadn't even been published yet. I don't know how influential Clark's reinterpretation has been, but I tend to think it must have uh, caused some of the confusion that you see in the literature about vis viva. And I think as Vincenzo shows so beautifully, we have to be very cautious in distinguishing a moment in 1686 
when Leibniz is focused on force and motion and the Cartesian view, and a moment in 1688 or after, when he's thinking about space, time, motion, and force, at least in part in relation to what Newton is doing in the Principia. Now, I would just note um, as a fourth point, for those of you who are interested in Newton, I think the same thing can be said about him in the sense that we have often forgotten how much he was focused on Descartes, just like Leibniz was. In fact, in 1686, almost in the same months when Leibniz was writing the Brevis Demonstratio, Leibniz was, uh, sorry, Newton was writing uh, the Principia. And many Newton scholars have failed to recognize that in the scolium on space and time, which everybody has read a million times, Actually, Newton is very close to just paraphrasing from Descartes. So there are a number of long passages where he's talking about how uh, an object that, let's say you have a, a, a walnut in a shell, an object that's inside of a shell will move when you throw the shell. He gives this example. And it's very strange, unless you realize this is exactly out of the Cartesian theory that the true motion of an object is a function of its changing vicinity, as Descartes puts it. And Newton says, um, it's wrong to think the true motion of an object is a function of its uh, changing relation to the surrounding bodies. So he's talking about the Cartesian view and coming close to paraphrasing the Cartesian view. And the reason he's doing that, of course, is that Newton, and he makes this clear in the scolium, Newton is trying to say, we should not take the Cartesian view that the earth is truly at rest because it doesn't change its vicinity within the vortex. We should reject that idea about motion. But if you forget that Descartes is the uh, opponent there, not Leibniz, not a relational theory of space, then some of Newton's remarks are very odd. So we need to integrate Newton into our understanding of this period in philosophy in both directions. We need to think of Newton as responding to Descartes and even paraphrasing from Descartes' Principia from 1644, just as we need to integrate Newton into our understanding of Leibniz, uh, as Vincenzo has so beautifully shown, so that we can understand the development of Leibniz's theory of space. I think in both cases, um, we, uh, despite everything that has been said in, in the last 10 or 20 years, um, we still forget that Newton is a key player in these um, disputes. So the last point is just um, a plea for all of us to think very carefully about when uh, a figure reads Newton's Principia and is in a position to react to it. And in, in a way, a more uh, fervent plea that we not read earlier debates through the lens provided by the Leibniz Clark correspondence. I think, as important as that is, we have to remember, as Vincenzo says, uh, that the Leibniz Clark correspondence occurs at a very particular moment, of course, toward the end of Leibniz's life. You can't reread Newton's Principia in the light of the correspondence, and you shouldn't read or reread Leibniz's manuscripts or letters from the 1680s in the light of that correspondence. They stand on their own. And what you find is this fascinating confrontation between 1686 and 1688 amongst Descartes and Newton, Leibniz and Descartes for the Brevis Demonstratio, and then Leibniz and Newton. And I think that uh, period, the very, very rich period in philosophy and science needs to be studied using Vincenzo's paper as a interpretive guide. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very, very much, Andrew. Um, um, Vincenzo, do you, would you like to respond in any way to that? No, thank you. I, I, I think it, it, it was perfect and, and very clear. I, 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 I think we may, may move to questions and, 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 and a more general discussion, do you think? Great. Um, if anybody has any questions, please use the raised hand function under reactions and uh, um, I'll call, call on you in the order in which you um, 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 respond. 
but we actually have a question already in the chat. Dennis Stagchi, would you like to uh, raise your uh, um, remarks? Sure, uh, I'll put some quotations that I need not read them all, I think. Uh, but I want to ask um, about the second uh, period of Leibniz uh, from 1672 on at least through the 1670s. Um, now, I found uh, one quotation from one uh, of the writings from that period, which not only does not expand the relational view of space as a relation between possibilities, but is inconsistent with it, as I, as I understand it. And uh, the quotation is, uh, there is something in space which remains through the changes, and it is this is eternal. It is nothing other than the immensity of God, namely an attribute that is one and indivisible, and at the same time immense. And now the crucial part, space is only, only a consequence of this as a property is of an essence. Now, uh, this is in consensus with, with the relational view as elaborated later on, because here space follows from God's immensity and not uh, from uh, the relations between finite things. Now, uh, this view that, that I just gave is not that far from what Clark himself states in his fourth letter uh, in the correspondence. So Clark large space is not a substance, but a property, and it's the property of that which is necessary. I'll skip this part. Space is immense and individual and eternal, and so also is duration. It does not follow from this that anything eternal is, is uh, or is it due, but are caused by an and our immediate and necessary consequence of his existence. Now, Leibniz, in his following letter, in his following reply, rejects this explicitly. Uh, and we might as well say that he rejects explicitly a very close relation of the view that he had stated in the 1670s. So it's not just a matter of elaborating the view uh, and adding the layer of, uh, to the non-substantiality of uh, space, but rejecting it in a more uh, uh, rejecting it uh, clearly and uh, starting with uh, to the, the issue of the relationality uh, non-substantiality of space is, is really separate from uh, the the uh, relational theory itself that had to be elaborated there. Uh, yeah, yes, so uh, 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 thank you very much. This text from, from, from 76, uh, uh, very particular in fact. Uh, uh, as you know, this was the period in which Leibniz was reading Spinoza and, and he wrote a lot of things in a, in a, in a, in a uh, I mean, he was really experimenting with, uh, with concepts at, at the time. But I think that these, these texts are, are in fact in keeping with the general evolution of Leibniz thought. That is, uh, uh, I, I had no time to uh, expand on, on, uh, on the reasons that brought Leibniz to abandon the substantivalist view of, on, on, on space that he endorsed when he was uh, younger. And, and uh, what is important in, in, in that passage that happened in the 70s, between 72 and 76, but, but mostly in 72, it, is that, uh, 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 Leibniz's rejection of substantial space uh, has, has nothing to do, in fact, with any of the arguments that he brought in, in the Leibniz-Clark correspondence. That is, it has nothing to do with the principle of indiscernible, the principle of reason, uh, uh, theological reason, or, or, or whatever. Uh, uh, Leibniz was thinking of, of uh, uh, I mean, as he said in a in a in a paper from seventy eight, I think at some point in Leibniz's natural philosophy, space became useless. That is, Leibniz didn't find any any use for it. And there is even a, a paper in which he says that we should reject substantial space since nothing would change if we would accept it. That is, in the physical world, would change nothing. And, and the theory which is, uh, I mean, which Leibniz is endorsing in, in 76 is that there is matter 
everywhere. And this matter is the only substance and the only extension in the world. There is no space. And the impenetrability of matter is due to the movement of matter itself. That is, since matter uh, has, has vortices, these vortices uh, prevent matter to, to penetrate uh, 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 other matter <laughs> and bodies with other bodies. The general outcome is that the Leibniz picture in 76 of the natural world is that there is matter everywhere, there is no space, uh, and this matter is uh, everywhere moving. However, he calls, I mean, he, he gives the, the example of a net. He says, imagine that the res extensa is a kind of net and that the moving matter are just waves on it or folds on the net. We may perhaps uh, a bit anachronistically, well, no, very anachronistically uh, 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 rephrase this point of view saying that it, no, it, no, it, no. Imagine there is a force field and imagine that matter is just the perturbation of the field. And at that point, Leibniz says, we can call the net itself, that is the force field, as the immensum or expansum or something that comes from God, some, something which is a consequence of God immensity. And, and, and so you have the very substance of things which is God uh, uh, himself, well, the immensity of God himself. But then you have matter only where this thing is moving and, and, and doing things and acting, because of course, activity is very important for Leibniz. And, and so this is the picture that you get in, in, in these passages from, from 76. It is important, however, that in, in 72, he abandoned the idea of a substantial space. And it is also relevant that before 72, when he endorsed the, the, a, a substantial space, he never ever uh, spoke about uh, God's immensity. That is, uh, uh, Leibniz's views on, on substantial space when he was young had nothing to do with theology on, or, or with God. Then in 72, he abandons substantiality. And in 76, for the first time, he says, well, space is not a substance. Nonetheless, there is something which is the immensity of God. So in a sense, he was substituting an ontology of substantial space with an ontology of non-substantial space plus uh, the, the immensity of God. And this is different from Newton and Clark, of course, because Newton and Clark insist that the immensity of, of God grounds somehow a kind of substantialistic view on space. It is sort of, I mean. Great, Andrew, do you want to add anything? No, I, I agree, especially with that last comment. I think that's definitely right. Great. Um, Gilbert Plummer. Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, when you were talking about Leibniz's middle view, you were saying that for him, uh, relations, spatial temporal relations, I think, are abstract. And I'm wondering how, how that can be. Uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> if something is actually earlier than or bigger than something else, it does not seem to be an ab abstract. Uh, feature, uh, whereas you talk about his later view, uh, <clears throat> where sp space is an ideal order of possible situations and and time possible uh, successions. I can see the abstraction there, but what about his middle view? Thank you. Uh, well, in the middle view, Leibniz insists that space is not abstract, but rather concrete. Uh, and the point is that, uh, I, I mean, what, what, what is framing uh, in this paper is a procedure through which we start from the concrete world of things, and then we begin to separate properties from it. That is, we... we look at, at the world of bodies, but we do not consider colors uh, or, or things. 
we look at, at that world and, and we abstract from active forces. Then we abstract from substantial forms that distinguish various organic bodies. Then we abstract from uh, 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 the impenetrability that makes matter. And then what is left is just extension. Now, this extension cannot be said to be itself abstract. It is rather a, a, a residuum of the concrete world from which we have uh, abstracted in the sense of separated everything. Is, it is a, a kind of Aristotelian aphiasis. I mean, it, it is something that was in the, in the, in the philosophical tradition that is not considering some properties of, of, of a concrete thing. And Leibniz calls it an abstraction procedure because he has no two different words to uh, uh, yeah. uh, say that we abstract uh, uh, yeah. humanity yeah. From, from human or, 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 or so it is an abstraction procedure that brings you a result which is concrete rather than abstract. Yeah. I I, I understood that. I thought you were also saying then in the middle period, his view was that relations were abstract. Not that they're abstract. Oh, oh, oh sorry. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I think that relations are abstract for Leibniz uh, 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 always. That is, he, he had a, a fairly scholastic theory of relations that had been studied in depth by, by, by Mignai and others. And for all these people, uh, relations are just uh, mental things and abstract things. So, I mean, this was not a, a, a new move from, from, from the late view or, or, or something. If something is relational, then it is abstract. So when, when he arrived in 88 to, to conceive space as a system of relations, I think that automatically, he conceived it also as abstract, just because all relations are yeah. abstract. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I was wondering why, but maybe we're getting off topic here. Why they thought of the relations that way as abstract? The main reason. Yeah, it, it has to do, of course, with a substantialistic view of, 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 of things. So, so, so you have substances, okay. you have accidents of individual accidents uh, of every substance. And, and as Leibniz said, you cannot have a substance, uh, an accident which has a leg into one substance and a leg into the other substance. And when, when you conceive relational things, you must think of them just as mental processes that, have, that, that may be grounded on non-relational properties, but uh, relations themselves are, are just mental. So if you say that uh, John is taller than James, uh, this relation is, is grounded somehow in, in how tall is John and how tall is James, but there is no ontology, no, no robust ontology of being taller than being taller than is just an abstraction, a mental thing that we produce uh, as, as thinking beings. When we look at John, we look at James and compare them. Okay, thank you. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's very common to, to reduce it to the, you know, the height. What you really have is a substance with a property. And then the relation, it's very common at this period to think the relation is just added by the conceiving subject or something. Certainly not the view of relations you'd get in the 20th century, of course. But yeah. Okay, Donna. Yeah, thank you, Vincenzo. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Vincenzo, this was great, fascinating. I totally buy the story. I wish I knew it earlier when I was kind of reading intuitively uh, Leibniz and Newton in the same key that you did without no historical arguments whatsoever. Um, I just want to kind of, by way of clarification, maybe to provoke you a bit further. Um, so granting that Leibniz's theory of space originates in his reading of the Brinkina and his intention, granting that his intention is to develop an alternative explanation to that of Newton and, you know, finding a finding at last a way to do that and so on. Um, 
why did okay why did these two alternative explanations only came to clash almost 20 years later okay hey uh, 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 well i i frankly do not know uh, uh, what 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 is really peculiar is that uh, uh, starting from uh, the early 89 that is just a few weeks after leibniz wrote uh, this the, this spectrum and inventorum and these first fragments on space he began to write a lot of papers against Newton. One on, 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 on the most famous is the Tentamen with the Motum Celestis Causes on, on, on the circulation of the planets, then one on gravity, then all the papers against Newton that he continued to write in, in, in 90, 91, 92, 93 at least. And in none of these papers, he ever mentioned space as a system of relations. And uh, especially in those that he published. So that Newton and Clark, as I said, when they read in, in 1716, that Leibniz believed space as a system of relations, they, they were, were caught off guards and, 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 and wondered what, what, what is this guy saying? What is he thinking? Now, the reasons why Leibniz didn't uh, 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 immediately used the theory of space to oppose Newton, uh, well, I, I'm not so sure. I, 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 I think we have to wait a bit more of, of texts that could be published. I mean, at the moment we are in a very unfortunate situation that the critical edition of Leibniz papers ends at 1690, that is just a few months, one year after the discovery of relational space. So we do not know the entire story of 91, 92, while he was writing these anti-Newtonian papers. In general, I would say that Leibniz was convinced that in order to criticize uh, 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 absolute motion, it was enough to say that there was no absolute space in the sense that space is not a substance, space is, is, is imaginary, space is a mental construction or something like that. And this is in fact something that he says in the anti-Newtonian papers from the 90s without advancing a positive theory that space in fact is not properly an imaginary thing but rather a system of relations. I mean, his only point, his strongest point is that space is not real and this is and this is repeated. Uh, 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 why he considered it a good thing to bring forth uh, this theory in the Leibniz Clark correspondence? Well, perhaps because he had developed it for 20 years and so he was more sure. I, I mean, after all, we have seen that, for instance, he calls ideal space just in only in 95 that is too late in, in the early 90s it was still developing the theory so this may be an explanation another may be that he didn't want to uh, 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 put forward a theory that could have been criticized by newton since he didn't need to do this in order to explain his own uh, his own natural philosophy uh, Can I add one thing to that? Or? Yes, yes. Yes, and I would just just to add to your point, don't forget Newton and Leibniz corresponded directly in 1693. Something we, exactly. again, we often forget exactly. because of the Leibniz-Clark. And I think you're right, if I recall correctly, there's no discussion of space in those two letters. Leibniz not does not object to absolute space. He is, he is, uh, he's, he praises Newton's work. And then he says, um, I, of course, I believe that there has to be a mechanism for the planetary motions, something like a swirling vortex, which he knows Newton rejects. But there's, other than that discussion of gravity, I don't think there's any discussion of space. So he, he could have presented his alternative relational theory in those letters and, and decided not to. So that fits with what you're hypothesizing here. <laughs> 
I think. But in general, it is true that Leibniz only wanted to give the minimum necessary yes, to right. justify his hypothesis. He, he's right. always doing right. so in metaphysics, in mathematics, with his theory of infinitesimal and so on. There is a bare minimum that, that allows you to, to accept his theory and, and there is no need to, to say more. Exactly. And, and, and I think th 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 this is the, yeah. Can I, can I put in a finger on this discussion? Yes. Though I know that there, there are other people um, waiting just to continue is that you were saying, one of the things that struck me that was very interesting was the um, um, passage in the in Inventorum that you point to as the very first one where he articulates his view is a marginal note. And one of the problems with marginal notes in Leibniz is he kept his papers for a long, long time. And he would sometimes come back to them. And um, is it clear that um, that marginal note dates from the same period or the same time as the, um, the rest of the essay? Here is one of the things that I was wondering in continuing what it is that uh, you and Andrew were talking about, about the lack of discussion in other papers we've got of Leibniz at that moment about the notion of space. If you look at the uh, manuscript that Bertoloni Melli um, edited, what it's now, what, 20, 25 years ago, a uh, marvelous job of taking this very puzzling manuscript and showing that what it really is, is developing ideas from a reading of the Principia. But what is it about? It is about the vortex theory. It is the genesis of the, um, uh, the Tentamen, um, which is about the vortex theory. And as I remember, there is no discussion in that manuscript of space. In the other annotated, you know, in the marginal annotations that we have of the Principia that were published some years before, as I remember, um, there is no discussion of space. Could that marginal note that you're using to date um, the um, first appearance of this theory of spaces relations actually be from maybe just a little bit later? It could be just a bit later. Yes, yes, but but just a bit in the sense that the the other fragments in which Leibniz began to think to talk about uh, about relational space are on Italian paper, and and and, and so I mean Leibniz moved to Italy in March eighty nine, so, uh, so if if Leibniz came back to the specimen inventorum adding this while he was writing things on Italian paper. I mean, this is possible. It, it, it's possible that, that it could be spring 89 or even summer 89 if you want to. But, but uh, I mean, these Italian papers are surely more developed than, than the marginal notes. And, and, and they say something more. So I, I, my, my guess is that that marginal notes come earlier than the later Italian manuscripts. It is still possible, it. yeah. I, no, I love, I love arguments like this. <laughs> uh, which kind of paper it was that Leibniz was, yes. <laughs> was, was writing about. Another thing is, I mean, he could have started developing it, you know, in Italy um, at that moment, gone back to the um, 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 Speckman Inventorum and made a little note to himself about this well, is absolutely possible. Yes. So yes. We're, we're talking though six months difference. It doesn't really obviously affect the um, you know the 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 uh, uh, the main thesis that you're giving. I, I, I may add that that, that the fact that in the Speckman Inventorum uh, he he mentions not absolute space but locus absolutus. Now, locus absolutus is an expression that you do not find in Leibniz. And the only other occurrence that I found of locus absolutus is in his uh, 
marginal notes on the Principia uh, uh, edited by Bertoloni mainly, where, where he says nothing, it, it, just, uh, it, it just registered that Newton talked about uh, uh, locus absolutus, but, but I'm, I, I see a, a connection there between these two texts. There, there may well be. Thank you very much. Uh, Bristol? Um, Terry? Yeah, thank you. So I've just been reading and uh, studying this a egregious amount of time. What I like to do with something like this is to uh, have a framework. So I'm really interested more in where did, what was the discussion about this before Leibniz and then where did it go after Leibniz that would help us understand both. And first of all, I, you know, I think that there was, oh, and also exactly who were his contemporaries discussing this, right? Euler and the Bernoullis and so forth, and uh, not just Descartes. And I think that one thing is uh, projective geometry uh, was, uh, was going on way before. It goes back to Pappas and, and Desarge and so forth. And I think that my guess is that what the space, the relational space that Leibniz is ultimately talking about is the space of projective geometry. And uh, I'll try and say why that. So, but I think his, his interaction with, with uh, uh, Huygens, Euler, Bernoulli's, all those guys in their critique of Descartes, they were coming up with things like the cycloid and the uh, path of swiftest descent. And these were not uh, things that fit into Euclidean geometry. So. And basically, projective geometry is supposedly a more general geometry. It includes Euclid as hyperbolic and, and uh, so forth. And Riemann picks up on this later, so forth. But the basic idea is that projective geometry is a more general concept. And uh, Euclidean geometry, which he, I think, Leibniz associates with uh, Newton, is, is a very limited, it would be a kind of a special case. Um, I also think in talking about the Leibniz uh, uh, Newton uh, correspondence that it, it's very important to realize that what what Leibniz really doesn't like is the concept of gravity, and and you know you got to get rid of gravity. Gravity is you know he's like this is this you know occult thing and it's you know it's causality at a distance and you know like it doesn't make any sense and it's incoherent and how can you possibly uh, uh, bring this into your world? But so the Newtonian world, though, it has that. And, but Newton has these two things. He has his linear three laws, and then he has his gravitational theory. And they don't really fit together, and that's even modern. Anyway, I think, so this, this, I think projective geometry is where it's coming from. I think uh, Aristotle's I don't like a vacuum is in there, too. But I think also that uh, uh, as, as pr prior ideas that were influencing Leibniz, uh, but where does it go? So I want to like, what have, where did Leibniz idea go? Well, so it comes up again in Maupertuis and Maupertuis, well, I, I, this is really about, about Andrew's comment about the vis viva, which I really like. Thank you for bringing it up. Because I think the vis viva thing, I look at it this way. So what, you know, it was like, is it MV or is it MV squared? And, and, and uh, Maupertuis comes up with this sort of enigmatic answer. He says, no, it's both. How can we both? And he has this idea of the orbit. You know, there's the uh, the mv linear going on and the mv square going down. This is a balance. You know, it's a it's a harmony, which I think Kepler picks up on a little bit too. It's a harmony of mv and mv squared. And uh, and there's all sorts of problems with what Maupertuis' version of it, but nonetheless. So, but what comes? But anyway, what he comes up with is the idea of action. That's what I wanted to get to. An idea of an action. He immediately refers it back to uh, Leibniz, and when he's pressed on the uh, on the, uh, what he means by that, he goes back to, to, to Leibniz and uh, the lines and curve, lines and curves are something that, that Leibniz talks about in his calculus. And that comes up again, very explicitly in Carnot. The lines and curves are complementary, if you like, they don't fit together. So they, that forces you up into a higher, higher order geometry. So you can't just have, uh, Newton's geometry is very linear. Everything's linear, lin, lin, lin. And he did, even his mv squared is, the, the extra v is, is a linear v, it's an impulse. Whereas what, what uh, Leibniz, I think, and then later in Carnot very nicely in his, in his 1803 geometry of position, uh, 
and, and fundamental principles of uh, equilibrium of motion, he's very clear. First of all, he thinks he's, ex he says, I'm trying to complete Leibniz's his program, his, his program of analysis situ, situ. And, and he says that, you know, and, and he picks up on the idea of action and action is not motion in the Newtonian sense. This is crucial. I, I think there's a tendency to think of MV squared in the Newtonian <laughs> version of it and MV squared in the Leibnizian version of it. MV squared in, in Leibniz's sense and in Carnot's sense is the living force and is conserved. And that's not the case with Newton. In Newton, you have these hard bodies colliding. And it's anyway, I think <laughs> just, I'm, I'm rambling on here, but I, I really like Andrew bringing up the vis viva thing. I think that's crucial. And I think that it has to do with it. What, what Newton meant by motion and what Leibniz means by motion are very different things. And uh, anyway, I'll shut up. <laughs> Thank you. Andrew, you want to go first or, or I'll go first? Go ahead. I, I, I wasn't sure <laughs> if there was a question or just. Well, I want to, so I want to hear from, from Vincento about whether, about prior ideas about, about the uh, projective geometry and the debates that were going on about that and the, the uh, you know, discussion with Huygens and so forth about non-Euclidean geometry. I think those are crucial. Well, about, uh, 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 well, the so-called projective geometry, of course, we do not have to project too much of, of, of 19th century geometry and, and projective geometry onto uh, uh, Leibniz or Pascal or Desargues, uh, et cetera. But it, there is no doubt that Leibniz began his project on the analysis situs uh, uh, after reading or in, 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 uh, in, in connection with his reading of Pascal's papers on conic sections that were uh, 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 offered by him when he was in Paris and, and, and in, in 76, 75, 76, he, he read them, he, he began to take notes. And in 77, he began to properly develop his analysis situs. And there is no doubt that this is connected with a general, let's say, projective approach to geometry that you find in, in, in those others. However, uh, I would not label Leibniz analysis situs as projective geometry properly. He had uh, the clear awareness that uh, there were quantitative, that is <laughs> metrical properties for us and, and properties that were not metrical. However, the properly projective geometry is, is not really there. He, he deals with similarity which is a kind of projection, but it is not as general as projection. And, and he has the idea of, of developing something which is not metrical, but not yet properly uh, 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 projective. Concerning the relation of this with the theory of space, I think it is important, but also, uh, 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 I mean, it may be misleading. I mean, there have been uh, 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 others, uh, in interpreters who read into Leibniz's project on the analysis situs from 1677, the clear mark that he had a relational theory of space already in 1677. And, and we have seen that this is not absolutely the case. The point is that you may conceive a geometry of situations even if these, you, you think that these situations are situations in space, that is, that the condition of possibility of these relations of, of situations is the fact that there is a concrete extension there as the background in which these situation obtains. These situational relations are situations, are, are relations between points of an already given space. Now, when you have this picture, you do not need, of course, to define space as a system of situation. And Newton had this picture. When Newton talks about the oido situs in, in, the, in the Principia, he has in mind something similar. That is, there is a space, and then there is an order of situation into this space. And when Newton was doing projective geometry, because Newton had some fantastic results in, 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 in projective geometry with conic sections. He was using this kind of space and this kind of notions of, of, of situations. What is interesting is that by 1688, when Leibniz endorsed 
a fully fledged uh, 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 theory of space as just a system of relations. He had already several hundred pages of geometrical studies on the analysis of situations. And it, it, I, I think this brought him very much in, 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 in to be, be able to conceive space as just a system of relations. When, when, when he said in, in 1688, okay, there is a space, there is a system of relations, now just eliminate space and stay with the system of situations without any background for, for, for it. When he did this move, that was the move in 1688, he already knew that with this system of situations, he could do good geometry, a lot of geometry, a lot of mathematics, because he had experimented it for some uh, 11 or, or 12 years. And, and, and he had several hundred pages of, on this kind of geometry. So I, I, I would say that this was a powerful impulse, in fact, in, in, in getting to the theory of, of, of relational space. But also I would like to stress that the two things are not implied. And, and, and that uh, one needs a, a, a further move. Uh, can I just, uh, well, so it seemed to me that when he goes to analysis situ that he's already in a relational space because what he's, what he's opposing is an absolute space. The thing is, I think is important is to, is to grasp, I think we fall into this a little bit, that there's Newton's absolute, you know, objective space, and then there's Leibniz objective space. So Leibniz object, and Leibniz space is not objective because it, you know, it can look at it from different perspectives. It's a possibility space, and you can look at it this way. You look at it, and it's developing too. It, it's emergent. These are these are things that are not appropriate for the Newtonian uh, thing. Anyway, I wonder if if Andrew has a comment on the this Viva thing. Well, there are other people waiting, so maybe we should let them jump in so we don't run out of time. Okay, Marlene. Hi, thanks for a totally fascinating event. Um, I have a question about, uh, I wrote down that in the marginal note, Leibniz said that there's no absolute place because there's no principle for determining the subject of movement. I don't know how accurate it is what I was what I wrote down, but it reminded me of the argument in on nature itself that um, you need force to um, individuate bodies and determine the subject of movement. How how are those two related to each other? Uh, yes, yes, okay, uh, uh, yes, it it. It is basically the same thing. That is to say, uh, 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 Leibniz was convinced since uh, 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 his early years that motion is, is just relational. That is, you may only define motion in relation uh, and the motion of a body in relation to other bodies and, and not in relation to an underlying space. Because in 72, he had denied it the underlying space and, 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 and in 76, he begins to say, then motion cannot be the motion of a body into space, but it is rather the motion of a body with relation, in relation to other bodies. Then when he introduced this conception of relational motion in, in 76, the first thing that, 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 that he does that, that, that preoccupied him was that this was a kind of slippery slope towards a full relativism of motion. That is to say that one could not uh, determine at all what is moving and what is not moving. So he, he was convinced, of course, that there were no empirical means, so to say, I'm, I'm simplifying a bit, to do this kind of work, because when you see two body moving, you may imagine that one is moving, the other is moving, and, and, and all possible situation. But he wants to preserve the idea that there is true motion in nature. And so already in, six, in, in 76 or 77, he introduces the idea that even though from an empirical point of view, all hypotheses on, on which bodies are moving and which are not moving are equivalent, nonetheless, 
there is something which is really moving, truly moving at, at, or, or, or not. And in 77, he comes out with architectonical principles. That is, we, we take the simplest possible explanation to be the true one. And in 78, he preserves this idea of the simplest hypothesis, but then he also adds the notion of forces and say the, the, the body which truly moves truly moves because it has some internal power, which I call force. And, 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 and so it gives a kind of metaphysical foundation uh, of, the, of the epistemological, let's say, so architectonical conception of, of, of true motion that he endorsed in, in, in 76. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I, I would just add that um, I, I completely agree as usual. Um, I may feign a disagreement someday just to make things interesting, but anyway, um, Newton, Newton had the same reaction to Descartes that Leibniz did in, in many ways. Namely, um, in fact, I think there's some beautiful connections between De Gravitationa, this Newtonian pub, unpublished manuscript and things that are in the specimen dynamicum. I mean, Newton thought that there's a, the notion of force is missing from Cartesian natural philosophy. And that's a key error and in a way Descartes first two laws of motion suggest that you need a notion of force to understand the true motion of a body but then Descartes doesn't quite succeed in articulating one I think both Newton and Leibniz had in a way a similar thought along those lines exactly on the subject you were uh, mentioning yes Gloria had a comment, but she thinks Vincenzo has already answered it. Yes, it's me. Yes, thank you. I, I just was quoting from the from the correspondence, Leibniz Clark correspondence, as the fifth letter of Leibniz, speaking about this uh, uh, absolute true motion of a body. So it was for me always a question how it could be. Uh, put together this idea of absolute true motion because it needs some conception of space somehow. But I suppose, yes, it was was uh, uh, Vincenzo was responding. Well, yes, yes, it's a kind of true motion in relation, still in relation with other bodies. And, and, and uh, I mean, there are uh, interpreters of, of Newton like Robert Renasiewicz who insist on the fact that both Leibniz and Newton started with the idea that there are true motions. And then what Newton is doing in the scholium is to uh, 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 make the inference, since there are true motion, then there is absolute space. And this kind of inference from true motion to absolute space is what Leibniz in the Leibniz part itself says, I do not see how this follow. Um, okay, uh, Victor uh, Blasio. Uh, right, yeah, yes. Uh, thank you, Vincenzo. That's very fascinating indeed. And uh, uh, my question was uh, in part uh, already brought up a previous question that this passage, no principles for determining the object of motion. And I think um, uh, indeed that seems to be just the old relativistic idea of more that the one, the part that Leibniz already shares with Descartes and Hawkins and everybody else, the same old thing, you know, you can't tell whether A or B is really moving. So it is, uh, it doesn't seem like it's enough to mot He brings that up as a justification for his new theory, but it's an old argument. So it can't be enough to, to sustain the new thing. Uh, I guess may maybe one could say that the old, uh, that that argument, the relativity argument in the old way had only be used in a kind of epistemological way. You know, you can't, the only thing you can ever know about bodies, the only knowable thing is relational, but that is not, and now the new thing is that he wants to do ontological stuff and wants to say what space really is. And that's the part that has not been, was not part of the the, convent, the old relativity uh, thing, I suppose. But, and, but, and I also want to, uh, if, should I, should we think about this? Uh, uh, when he abandons then in this context of Newton, he abandons his middle theory and he develops a new one. Is it because the middle theory, when he said, you know, let's subtract color and extension or uh, uh, ex all the properties uh, that are not uh, uh, with position, uh, if we subtract all of that space is what's left. And uh, why could he not uh, maintain that and 
still you know use that to attack Newton. You know, so does he believe that if you combine this theory that space is what's left when you subtract away all the incidental things, uh, if you if you apply that in a Newtonian paradigm, you're going to end up with absolute space. You know, so we give the wrong answer. You know, this theory of space is that the reason why he has to abandon it. I wonder. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah. 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 This is a very, very, very deep question. I, I think that in order to answer it, we, we really need at this point the complete publication of the papers from the 90s by Leibniz and philosophy. Because I, I saw some manuscripts that are still unpublished in which Leibniz, well, in the 90s, uh, or, or perhaps even in the early uh, uh, 1700, still talks about space as a concrete extension. Of course, I mean, one theory does not exclude the other. If you think that space is a system of relations, you may still get to a pure extensum through this process of abstraction. So what Leibniz seems to think is that when you go further with this process of abstraction, you really get something like this pure extensum, but this is the wrong notion of space. That is what the kind of space that you use in geometry and the, and the kind of space that you use in physics is not really this one, but is just the order of situation. So you may go further with this kind of abstraction procedure. You will get to, to some extended object mental, phenomenal, concrete, uh, etc. But this is not what is useful in, in science. And so you should not employ this one, but rather a completely different perspective on space conceived as, as an order of situations. And in fact, in both these texts that I know from later periods in, in which Leibniz talks about this extensum purum, he says that this is called the space vulgo, or according to the school. So apparently he was uh, still conceiving this uh, uh, abstraction procedure as possible, but uh, as the wrong way of pinpointing what space is, I, I, I guess. But, but, but I really think we have to get to the whole papers there in order to understand better what, what it was, was uh, was doing with this kind of pure extension after uh, 1688. Okay. Um, Terry Bristol, you have another question? I could, yeah. So I, um, trying to get it at what, again, the thing that I was hoping Andrew would talk about, about the vis viva thing, and, and simply that that the concept of motion in Leibniz is not the same as the concept of motion in, in Newton. And, and the difference is, I mean, that one of the ways they put it is in Newton, you have, you know, body A uh, acts on body B, contact, boom. In, in uh, Leibniz and uh, Lazar Carnot, who is my, my focus, you know, he's very explicit. He says, we're no longer interested in causes like this, this mechanical cause. We, we just forget about those. He says we're interested in the communication of motion. Now, motion is really, for them, it's a different kind of thing. So I, I put in the chat a little bit, suggesting that, but motion for Leibniz and, and Carnot is, it's a change in the organizational structure of reality, okay? So it's not like one thing moving relative to something else in some sort of absolute space. It's a development. It's a, it's a emergent development of space-time. It's a change in the relationships between everything. And uh, the change in one, it changes everything. So, but, so that their motion is this action, has this, also has this dual aspect that uh, comes out of uh, the vis viva thing properly understood in my mind anyway. But I, I, I would just suggest to people here, Lazar Carnell was incredibly underappreciated. And he ex very explicitly says, I'm completing Leibniz's program. And I think it's very, very helpful to, to look at Lazar Carnot. It's two mature things, the uh, fundamental principles of uh, equilibrium of motion and his geometry of position, which is all the thing about analysis that you in perspective, all the different geometries. But if you look at those and you say, hmm, I mean, for me, everything that's in Lazar is already there in Leibniz. 
But in Leibniz is kind of confused. And of course, as he said, he writes, writes and fits and starts. So I just suggest you people read Lazar Carnot and there's some insight, you'll gain some insights in understanding uh, Leibniz. No. I don't have much to say about Carnot, but I'll just say that um, on Vis Viva, there's a wonderful paper by George Smith, a very short one in Physics Today. I can put the reference in the chat, which helps to dispel the anachronistic characterizations of the dispute, which are really widespread, even in history of science, when very outstanding historians of science characterize the Vis Viva dispute. It's very often in terms of concepts that didn't appear on the scene until 1687 with the Principia when they're trying to talk about things that you know Leibniz said in 1686. Uh, that may not seem like a big difference, of course, but <laughs> it makes all the difference in the world if you're using Cartesian terminology or if you're using Newtonian concepts, which are supposed to be opposed to the Cartesian terminology. Anyway, I'll put that in the chat. If people are interested in Vis Viva, it's a very helpful, uh, very short article. Yeah, please do. And I, I agree with you totally that, I mean, the, the number of articles on the Vis Viva controversy that just completely don't get it. And it's because, partly it's just confusion because MV squared in Newtonian terms and MV squared in Leibnizian terms are quite different things. And MV squared in Leibnizian terms is living force. And that's not what it is in, in its impulse in, in Newton. Anyway, it's, it's a subtle issue and, and as yet not resolved. Maybe this George Smith is resolved, I hope. <laughs> um, thank you. Daria has one last question. And this will have to be the last one. Okay, thank you. It's just a question. Maybe maybe someone kind of told me, uh, what about Christian Wolf and Wolfians? Uh, are, are their concept of relational space is the same as uh, Leibnizian? Because we are translating now Euler's Reflexions uh, sur l'espace le temps, and uh, it's he he's making this uh, discussion uh, with uh, metaphysicians, uh, Wolfians metaphysicians, but uh, in some arguments. Uh, it, it seems that it's not really their order of situation they are talking about, but more about a simple relational concept, like we should understand motion uh, in relation to the neighbor bodies, for example, or for, to other bodies. Maybe someone can tell me. I, I, would think, I would say you're right. I've been reading a lot of that. And, and what happened in the, in the debates between uh, Leibniz and the Bernoullis and so forth. They were having their little discussion. And then they, and they said, oh, well, Leibniz or Huygens has already got this. Particularly this, this idea of the path of swiftest descent, which does not fit into any of the other. It didn't fit in the Newtonian thing, doesn't fit in the Cartesian thing. That's the real key, the, the, guy, the idea of the cycloid. And, and of course, this, the cycloid was crucial to Huygens. He, he realized that as his pendulums were going down, they were actually forming a cycloidal uh, uh, pattern at the bottom. He tries to make the perfect uh, thing. Anyway, yeah, I, I agree with. You. I think I think Huygens is, and of course Leibniz studied with Huygens. <laughs> he was young, you know, and they have course. I was just looking at the Leibniz uh, Huygens correspondence, trying to figure out, you know, like what this. But I, I don't have an answer. But I absolutely agree that that's a very interesting line to look at. And with this, I think we probably have got to end. And thank you all, particularly uh, Vincenzo uh, and Andrew. Thank for, you, Andrew. For session and a wonderful discussion from the audience. Thank you very much. I hope to see you all in person some, somewhere sometime. We do, we do too. Um, next week, there's going to be another panel on Leibniz, Leibniz on Quantity Measure and Force. Filippo Constantini um, and uh, Jeffrey Awani, um, Filippo from the uh, University Foscari of Venice, uh, Jeffrey Awani from McMaster at the University of Paris. Um, same time, same place. And then on March 26th, there's going to be a special event. Um, Saturday, March 26th. 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Princeton time. A panel on philosophy as Descartes found it with Brian Copenhaver, Calvin Normore, 
and myself. So we hope to see you all at these uh, uh, next uh, events. But thank you all very, very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ciao.